Can you hear me? Everybody hear me? You can hear me. Thanks, Steve. Look, what I'd like to do today is to... Um, <coughs> I've, I've got a paper and I've circulated a paper for you all and um, um, you'll probably be, dis be distracted and looking at the paper all throughout the course of uh, while, the time, while I'm talking. But what I want to do is rather than field questions during the time that the, in the 30 minutes, I think I've got about 30 minutes, have I? Um, something like that. All right. Um, what I want to do is to address, um, in the course of 30 minutes, it's going to be hard for me to uh, seek to demonstrate to you how in the higher jurisdictions to uh, present a capable plea, because there are so many things to talk about. I think what I'd prefer to do is, having had the advantage of so many of my colleagues having gone on to higher places and been far more successful than me, is I rub shoulders with them and I talk to them about the sorts of things that interest them as judges um, <clears throat> and as people who sit on tribunals and so forth. What are the sorts of things, it's hard with a pneumatic drill behind me at the moment, I don't know whether you can hear it, but I can hear it and it's distracting me, but what are the things that really interest them? What do they want to hear? Um, <clears throat> You know, let's not beat around the bush. What are the sorts of things that they want to hear? Uh, what are persuasive? What turns them off? What annoys them? Um, and there are a number of topics here that, in this document that I've circulated, that uh, I don't want to delve into deeply. I just want to make a point about each topic um, because it seems to me that, that there are some fairly obvious points to make in relation to each of these particular topics which will be very helpful for you when you're presenting your pleas. Now I want to start by um, <clears throat> reminding you about something that uh, a very learned, experienced uh, uh, family member who just happens to be here today told me when I started. He said this, he said, anyone can do a plea, not anyone can do a good plea. And that's very sound. Uh, uh, it's been my experience in I think the 22 or odd years that I've been practicing. Anyone can do a plea. Your Honour, my client is 25. Uh, he's married. He has two children. He's a plumber, lives in Narry Warren. That's a plea. It's the most boring plea, but we hear them every day of the week. You've got to not be monotonal. You've got to engage the listener. You've got to be persuasive. You're making a plea. You're not boring. You're not there to bore the listener. You're there to engage and persuade. So don't be monotonal. Be persuasive in using every uh, tool in your armour. And looking at the person you're speaking to, not, uh, and, and it's uh, evident uh, from my perspective as a teacher in the reader's course or with uh, George Hample on occasions, people, the judge sees the head and, and it's hardly persuasive because the person's always looking down at the, at the documents in front of them and it's just not persuasive. You've got to look at the judge, be persuasive and if you've got a point, stop Wait till he looks up to see what on earth the stoppage is for and then make your point. So, Your Honour, no use sending this fellow to jail. You've got an opportunity to be constructive here. Use pauses. Use... I've often said to my readers, and it's serious advice, that imagine you're having a drink at a bar with the judge you know, if and, and look at the person and really talk and engage. And that is persuasive and that is convincing. And the judge appreciates that. Preparing for the plea. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Amelia couldn't uh, have hit the head, hit the nail on the head any better when she uh, refers to that topic. Um, <clears throat> in preparing for the plea, um, I'm finding, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that what's happening is by the time the trial comes, or by the time the plea comes around, it's invariably 18 months later or two years later or, or if not longer on some occasions, and it's a different Crown uh, 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 prosecutor who's uh, the solicitor 
and there's no recording of the settlement of the terms of uh, the plea. And so what you really should do is after you perform or have had an involvement in the committal is settle the terms at that stage, at the committal stage. Make sure that the settlement terms are thoroughly recorded in writing and exchanged with the other side at about the time of the committal um, so that there's no dispute later on. Um, and this can simply be done by making a simple note when you get back to the office uh, uh, on your computer, uh, a file note for your own file, and you can say, look, uh, attach it to an email, send it to the solicitor for the other side, look, I've just uh, done a little uh, a note for myself, um, uh, would you accept that this accords with uh, what happened today? Uh, I've put it on my file. Just something as simple as that, so that in months to come, uh, you can look back at that and there's no dispute about what the terms of the plea have been. Um, alternatively, of course, at the committal, if you're appearing or if you're not appearing, you can ask counsel to ensure that it's recorded on the transcript what the terms of the settlement are. Now, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that um, you have to, by uh, virtue of a practice note now, serve and file any expert reports at least a day before the plea. Be conscious of that. Judges now are getting pretty stroppy when you turn up and you haven't exchanged things and you don't want to be on the back foot from the word go. You don't want the prosecutor saying, well, I haven't seen this before, Your Honour. This is... Uh, you want to be uh, perceived when you appear before the judge as reasonable, prepared and uh, uh, thorough and you don't want to be on the back foot from the word go. Um, in preparing the case, it's worthwhile, well in advance of the plea, obtaining a favourable attitude on sentence from the OPP as best you can, well in advance of the hearing. Um, some practitioners, I know uh, Jeff Tobin is one of them, he's always on my back about how it is, look, I want this material to get to the judge well in advance. And it's been his experience that that's been very good because uh, it's also provided to the prosecution and he can discuss where they're going, how they're approaching the case. Uh, uh, look, prosecutor, now that prosecuting solicitor, now that you've got this material, do you see where we're coming from? Uh, we're going to be angling for this sentence. And you'll invariably find that the solicitors um, um, are very reasonable and are prepared to accept that where you're uh, aiming for uh, is not unreasonable. And uh, there's an old school of thought that you just keep everything uh, hidden until the day. Um, but times have changed, I suggest, and it's probably sensible now, particularly given that the Crown can make uh, uh, nowadays, uh, do make, and, and are invited to make uh, uh, submissions in relation to sentencing range, it's better to try and engage the prosecution in advance and try and settle things or reach common ground uh, well before the time of the hearing. The OPP, in my experience, appreciates this cooperation. And if you get a favourable attitude, just it, it, it's not a question of trying, tying them down to, to, so that they won't wriggle out of it. Uh, uh, generally speaking, people are honest and uh, uh, adhere to agreements uh, and so forth, but uh, often there's confusion that surrounds an agreement that's been reached. So just put it in writing and bung it off to the prosecutor being a, an email, uh, simply done, to confirm that this is what we talked about and, and this is where we both have common ground in relation to the sentence or whatever. And it's worth volumes later on if there's any dispute. Um, character witnesses. Don't call them cold. Uh, we've all done it. We've all been under pressure. We've all got work at the last minute. The clients come in that morning, so you do a plea for him that day. But, uh, and he says, I've got Joe Blow here. But you really are doing yourself a disservice or the client a disservice if you don't just talk to the witness first for two reasons. First of all, if you talk to the witness first, if you really uh, find out a bit about what the witness is able to say, then you're, you're, you're finding out what you can lead in chief from the witness. Uh, otherwise, you're just standing there thinking, uh, uh, what question I ask? I'll ask the next question. What's the, well, I'll ask this. You know, I've got four questions, five questions out of this character witness. You're sort of exploring on your feet, whereas if you've prepared the witness in only five minutes of conversation earlier, you get a little bit more of a feel about the sorts of things that the witness can say. Of particular concern, though, is that if you call a witness and, and <coughs> you're unaware as to what the witness might say about the facts of the case, Unbeknownst to you, when this fight that your client has been involved in, 
uh, was unfolding, uh, he was uh, this witness also there and uh, might be asked under cross-examination, oh, you were there, were you? What did you see? And then, if, you know, you've got this sort of thing. Oh, we were all at the complainant's home when she changed out of a school uniform before we gave her the drugs. And, and then you're thinking, oh, you know, I wish I hadn't called that client. So don't, that witness, don't call the witness cold. Uh, there's a funny story about Terry Sullivan who called a, a, a witness uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, Terry won't mind me saying this, uh, the, the person uh, wore a turban and uh, he said, I call uh, Ahmed Ahmoud and uh, Ahmed Ahmoud, Ahmed Ahmoud, Ahmed Ahmoud and then uh, as the tip staff went out to get Ahmed Ahmoud, Terry said, oh he's a fella in the turban. So a man came in in a turban. He got in the witness box and Terry said, are you Ahmed Ahmoud? He said, I am not. He said, uh, are you from, uh, is your address 21 Bandura Road, uh, Scoresby? He said, that is not my address. He said, are you a radiologist? He said, I am not. He said uh, to his honour then, your honour, I have no further questions. <laughs> but uh, he tells me that he was particularly annoyed when the prosecutor wanted to ask cross-examination. <laughs> uh, so, so make sure you know your witnesses, even if over the course of five minutes beforehand. Um, if you do ask questions of a witness that's your witness, don't ask leading questions. If for 10 minutes you get yes, no, no, yes, yes, I agree, yes, no. That's about as convincing as, well, I don't know. It's not very convincing. Ask open questions of your witness because then the witness talks. Ask the witness to engage. You don't know the accused uh, very well. The witness does. So get the judge to hear from this witness what this person is like. And interestingly, judges are anecdotally telling me that... Um, Character witnesses are not being called as much. And in the county court and Supreme Court, you tend to uh, have that opportunity to, with more time being given to the matter, uh, take the opportunity to call witnesses. <coughs> <coughs> now, the case that's flavour of the month, of course, is Verdon's, the Queen and Verdon's. And I've spelt out succinctly here how, generally speaking, Verdon's is authority for the proposition that impaired mental functioning at the time of the offending or at the time of the plea may moderate, <coughs> even eliminate completely, considerations of general or specific deterrence as a sentencing consideration. Now, what's happening is <coughs> uh, defence counsel are continually attending court and submitting, oh, Your Honour, but at the time of the offending, uh, my client uh, was very depressed, and the psychologist says as much, uh, Your Honour. Well, that's all very well, but you've got to be able to, before you can utilise the principles in Verdon's to your advantage, demonstrate a connection between the impaired mental functioning and the offending. And the authority for that proposition is the case that I've referred to of Vaudreau, 2009 Victorian Supreme Court uh, uh, at 262. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's very important because I'm finding Liz Gaynor, for example, suggested to me the other day how it is that people are simply coming along and saying, oh, Verdon's Your Honour. But make the link. You've got to make the link if you're going to say that at the time the person was suffering from, for example, uh, 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 depression. It's no good to say, Your Honour, he was depressed at the time. Rather, he was extremely depressed at the time, Your Honour, and here's the medical report or the psychologist's report, and it can demonstrate, to, in my respectful submission, Your Honour, how at the time this condition was impacting upon his judgment at the time. So if he's engaged in this offending, Your Honour, take into account, would you, how it is that at the time, uh, if he was thinking about what he was doing, he wasn't really thinking properly, Your Honour, and that's because he was gripped by this condition. Make the link. Um, <clears throat> when taking instructions, tell your client, often they'll ask you to make a silly submission. Just say to them, listen, mate, I'm not going to pursue that. That's ridiculous. 
And I said, oh, well, why not? And you say, because if I argue one silly proposition, the judge is going to ignore all the rest of them. Just like this hell's angel who's trying to convince you that he's got the baseball bat in the boot in relation to this assault that he's engaged in, uh, <coughs> that, you know, he's, it's not generally there for the purposes of, uh, of assaulting people, but rather because on Wednesday nights he's got social baseball. I mean, that's just rubbish. If he wants you to run that sort of argument, just, just tell him no. If he, if he insists, you're his counsel and you've got it. But just don't dwell on it. Um, content of the plea. Plan your plea. Remember when you were at university or school and the teachers would say, look, spend the first three minutes or something planning your plea. Give it structure. Judges hate how it is that barristers will come in, they'll start on a topic, they'll jump to another topic, then they'll go on to another topic, but then they'll come back to the first topic, then they'll go... Over. It's frustrating for them. You want to um, try and keep the judge, uh, make it as easy for the judge as possible. Uh, you might think they have an easy job to begin with, but I can tell you that they tell me they don't and they find it difficult and you want to help them. Don't get them offside. Um, structure your plea. Do you have an openings? Make some opening remarks. Your Honour, this is, uh, I want to uh, do this, that and the other and eventually make uh, some submissions. Be chronological. Don't be disjointed. Uh, Johnny Smallwood uh, says Frank Vincent told him, there are four things I want to know. Who is he? What's he done? Has he done it before? And what do you want me to do about it? And uh, that's, in a nutshell, <laughs> basically what you have to address. But um, <clears throat> I find that uh, judges will get particularly upset if you simply, in relation to the psychologists or psychiatric, psychiatric reports, rely on, rely on them as the content of your plea. In other words, don't simply say to the judge, Your Honour, there's a psychologist report here. It's been uh, provided to you in advance. The background's all set out there. Uh, you have to be conscious that what they're going to be doing subsequent to this, um, the old days where viva voce, voce they will impose a sentence straight away, seem to be gone. No one seems to be able to do it anymore. But uh, uh, it's frustrating because we have to come back for sentences many days later for what really is, uh, you might think, a relatively straightforward matter where the plea uh, or where the sentence is often uh, uh, not hotly in dispute. We all anticipate it's going to be a suspended sentence, but nevertheless the judge will take days to, to, to pen a sentence. Uh, but what the judge uh, uh, has to do is in that uh, written sentence is go through the background uh, of the uh, accused. And so I find that a judge always appreciates if, if you are going to say, look, the background is set out in the psychiatrist or psychologist's report, Your Honour. I find that it's often appreciated by a judge if you say, but having said that, let me just succinctly summarise it for you. And so you, you, you can put the current circumstances, age, relationship situation, accommodation situation, uh, um, occupation situation, uh, spell that out succinctly for them. Uh, and, and and go through the background chronologically, succinctly for them. Um, statistics uh, are, um, to some extent, uh, the Court of Appeal is sceptical at times about their efficacy, but um, it's comforting to note that the Court of Appeal in White's case recently has uh, uh, endorsed how Statistics provide an indication of sentencing trends and standards. Consistency in sentencing is a fundamental objective of the criminal law. The rule of law requires that like cases be treated alike. And the Sentencing Council's uh, website is referred to there, and that might assist you uh, to uh, find where the sentencing snapshots are. The manner of the plea. I've already dealt with this to some extent, but um, <clears throat> The reader's course always sees George Hample uh, telling us in no uncertain terms how we must have a case concept. And originally, all those years ago when I started the course, I used to think, oh, case concept, you know, what's he talking about? Um, it, it, it's, 
it, it, it's so true. You must be able to go in with an with a concept of what you're going to be asking about, with a, an appreciation, a, a considered idea of what's your angle. And the sort of thing you might want to say, your case concept might be something like this. Look, Your Honour, there's no sense simply uh, jailing this person when you can do something constructive to affect his rehabilitation. And that's the gist of my plea, Your Honour. And then all of your pleas should be focused in on trying to persuade the judge on that topic. For example, um, you might, the gist of what you want to convey to the court is that the imposition of a conviction will effectively deny him entry into the profession. He's spent six years studying for, Your Honour, so please don't impose a conviction. Um, that might be your case concept. Spell it out and make it clear to the judge. Make a judgment in advance about whether you're going to tell the judge from the outset what penalty you'll be seeking. What I mean by that is, <clears throat> say you want a particularly lenient sentence. It's perhaps inadvisable. You have to give some thought to as to where you're going to tell the judge in the course of your plea that you're seeking that particular lenient sentence. If you get up at the outset and say, look, Your Honour, in relation to this case where the uh, accused has occasioned a detached retina and uh, uh, brain damage uh, consequent upon the assault, I'm seeking a good behaviour bond. Well, the judge is going to scoff right from the outset. So it's perhaps inadvisable to put that at the commencement of your plea. Sensible thing might be to keep the judge in the dark about what you're ultimately going to be asking about, present a wealth of magnificent plea material, including uh, about his health and so forth, which suggests that really this is an unusual case and that really I've got to extend lenience here. So that by the time you come to say to the judge, look, judge, um, <clears throat> really, this is extraordinary, this case. It calls for the imposition of a good behaviour bond. You might find at that stage that the judge will be receptive to that suggestion. And you won't have had the judge offside throughout by the initial submission on sentence that you've made. I've always found that it's better to let the judge know early what the prosecution's attitude is, that is, if it's favourable, um, <clears throat> because um, I detect, uh, and it happened the other day before Judge Rose, Rosines and I was having a talk to him about it later, as soon as I let the judge know that the prosecution was, was not opposed to a non-immediate sense of imprisonment, I, I could see him put his glasses down and his pen down. It was all over, Red Rover. He was on side at that stage. Let the judge know in advance or, or well forward uh, uh, in the structure of your plea what the attitude of the prosecution is if it's favourable. <clears throat> Matters that arise in the plea. Should I call my client? Look, generally speaking, there's no golden rule about this. Um, I remember Brian Rolfe uh, telling me, never, ever call your client. There are different schools of thought about this, but uh, we all uh, uh, have had different experiences. Uh, it may be that if your client is particularly... Uh, you have to go by the, uh, consider the, the circumstances. You might have a, a relatively benign prosecutor. What I mean by that is somebody who's not out for blood. You might have a judge who's very uh, decent and not, uh, 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 they're all decent of course, but uh, you might have a judge who is uh, more receptive than others uh, to submissions and so forth and kinder in terms of uh, the way the judge might deal with a particular witness. But if you are going to call a client, you might consider, well, look, in these circumstances, if this client is particularly articulate and persuasive and decent, then you might want to call the client. But generally speaking, it's unwise because most people, unfortunately, who are charged with offences, 
come from backgrounds where they have not had the advantage of uh, a formal structured education and aren't as articulate, don't do themselves as justice in the witness box. And so, generally speaking, it may be unwise to call a client. It is terribly unwise to call a client where you've got a prosecutor who's capable and uh, uh, particularly vicious. You wouldn't want to do that in those circumstances. Sometimes, of course, it's un unavoidable. You might uh, have to, for example, in, in a case where you're charged with cultivation simpliciter uh, uh, and where that where it's disputed as to whether the cultivation was uh, uh, committed in circumstances where it was uh, for a commercial purpose or not. If your client says, well, look, I, I didn't, I grew it, I admit it, but it wasn't for a commercial purpose, I'm not talking about a commercial quantity, just talking about his intention, because if, it's, if the judge uh, determines beyond reasonable doubt that it was for a commercial purpose, well, you get a bigger whack. So what you've got to do is call your client in those circumstances, but for goodness sake, prepare the client. What I mean by that is not tell the client what to say. What I mean by that is anticipate for the client in conference the sorts of things, the sorts of questions that are going to arise, the sorts of things that the prosecutor is going to uh, put to, to him. Look, you know, there are 775 plants here. They're all for personal use, are they? Etc. Obvious questions, but go through those sorts of things with the accused before you uh, uh, even remotely contemplate calling the accused. These days, <coughs> unlike the old days, the prosecution uh, is generally speaking now, as a matter of course, asked by a judge, you know, what, what's, what's uh, the sentencing range that you'd submit? And look, I've got to say, and, it, and it's not my own experience, uh, having spoken to judges and having even attended uh, a couple of years ago a, um, uh, a workshop on pleas, um, it's the experience of judges that, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, what's happening is that the prosecutors are coming along and quite regularly asking for sentences uh, or suggesting that the appropriate range is very high. Uh, uh, and it's frustrating to judges. I'm finding that my own experience is that prosecutors, uh, when they uh, are invited to articulate what they suggest is the appropriate sentencing range, the judge will ridicule them. Now, um, I don't know, who knows for what reason these instructions are being given by the director. Um, perhaps he's uh, otherwise distracted, but <laughs> keep the Court of Appeal in mind. Um, take the opportunity offer a reason, uh, take the opportunity to, to take issue with it, have it on transcript, put to the judge, look, Your Honour, uh, I appreciate I've made my submissions. My friend has just articulated what the Crown submission is in relation to range, but I, I need to state, and don't say it's because you want it on transcript, but you do want it on transcript, because the Court of Appeal will be looking at this potentially, that what the prosecutor has just said, uh, if you uh, accept what the prosecutor has just said, Your Honour, you'll be falling into appellate error. And um, you might want to offer a, a reason why uh, that's the case and say, look, the range suggested by the prosecutor, Your Honour, doesn't give adequate rec recognition to uh, the various matters put in mitigation, A, B, C, D. Spell it out. Victim impact statements. Um, <clears throat> look, John Smallwood's view, and y you can gather that I'm a big rap for John, is you can't do much about them. You really can't do much about them. The fact of the matter is some judges, you can take the judge through this and you say, look, judge, in relation to this victim impact statement, on page 14, um, there's this uh, bit here, that's objectionable. You know, you're on a where she says, uh, uh, how this idiot could have done this to my son, he ought to be hung. That should be uh, excised and take you here, Your Honour, this should be excised. That... What you're doing is uh, you might be highlighting the, the victim, impact to the victim impact statement to the judge. Don't be too flustered about the things. There's not much you can do about them, unfortunately. Um, you might like to say, 
a sensible approach might be to, and, and uh, perhaps it's obsequious, but you might be uh, 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 get brownie points. Uh, I find that it works. You might say to them, look, look, Your Honour, there's a victim impact statement here. Um, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll leave it to Your Honour's better judgment to uh, uh, make a judgment as to what's uh, admissible in this document. Um, clearly, there's aspects of it which uh, you would expect, Your Honour, we'd take issue with. Uh, but I'll leave that to Your Honour's good judgment as to uh, what uh, you will and won't uh, emphasise. Look, it's frustrating because sometimes later you hear the judge uh, uh, spelling out uh, the terms of the sentencing judgment and, and spends reams and reams of the uh, judgment on the victim impact statement. But the fact is there's really little you can do about it. Um, it's frustrating, I know. But... Um, <clears throat> It's extremely dangerous challenging a victim impact statement and therefore requiring the victim to attend for the purposes of cross-examination. So uh, it's best to just shy away from them. I've had a discussion with John Smallwood about this. That's his view. Uh, move on to and concentrate on your good points. Um, there's a little bit here about contested pleas. They're very rare these days. Um, <clears throat> what I mean by contested plea is this, that it's where there's disagreement about uh, something which is a non-element, uh, a guilty plea to cultivation simpliciter, like I suggested before, but where disagreement exists in relation to whether the crop was grown for a commercial purpose. The case, of course, in relation to this is Story's case and the citations given, but there's no general onus of proof uh, in a sentencing hearing. However, as a practical matter, if you want a judge to regard something as mitig mitigatory, you'll need to raise it. And generally speaking, a sentencing judge needs to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt if he or she is to sentence on the basis that a fact is adverse to an accused, but needs only to be satisfied on balance if he or she is to sentence on the basis that a fact is favourable to an accused. Um, so just bear in mind... <clears throat> that a judge during the course of a hearing, uh, if you've settled the facts by agreement, you might be confronted with the judge saying, this is, uh, I can't accept that. I just can't accept it. Uh, what about this, that and the other? The judge doesn't have to accept the agreed statement of facts. So just be conscious that if the judge is to uh, find uh, a fact adverse to you, you need to be able to say to the judge by way of submission, Your Honour, you couldn't be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt about this, that or the other. Uh, and you'd need to be before you make an adverse finding in relation to that fact against the accused. So look, in the course of the time that I've spoken to you, I've, I've, I hope that I've addressed a lot of matters which uh, will assist you rather than going into detail about every uh, particular topic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you both. Um, just saying a word or two more about uh, Sean's fundamental point, that it's essential to be able to engage the sentencing tribunal uh, and to, by engagement, to persuade there are some cases where that can be extremely difficult because the offending is so serious that you are met with a judge who is white with anger uh, and even without a victim impact statement is uh, working him or herself up to imposing the maximum possible sentence and thinking only about how they're going to uh, craft their reasons to be able to justify such a sentence and to hold the sentence in the Court of Appeal. And it's extremely difficult in those circumstances to engage the tribunal either initially or at all. Uh, it is essential to think in advance just how you're going to do that. And I'm reminded of uh, a case that uh, I heard uh, when I first came to the, the bar and uh, it was a fairly senior practitioner who 
was doing a plea on behalf of somebody who was charged with very serious offences and had an extremely long history. And um, he started off by saying to the judge, when I first got the brief in this matter, I thought there was nothing favourable that could be said for this uh, offender. And he paused and he let that sink in and then started slowly peeling back the more emotive layers of the prosecution case. And having done that as far as it was reasonable, went on slowly to start building up the offender to a point where the whole atmosphere in the court changed and he had uh, engaged the judge, got the judge's ear, and um, I don't recall what the outcome was, but it was a lot better than it would have been if uh, he had simply trotted out uh, by rote the various components of a standard play. Now, um, having heard these two, they're ready, willing and eager to answer any questions that uh, you may have of them and uh, I'd be pleased to hear anybody who has any questions that they would like to put. Yes. So what I basically get from this morning is more or less judges are false. I hear it every day. So regardless of this use of unanimity, except what's happened, draw a line in the sand, um, put it to the judge, you can't change what's happened. Almost do a balance sheet of debits and curts in regards to moving forward what <coughs> the appropriate sentence may or may not be. Given the recent controversy of the uh, witness uh, impact statements that was floated over the papers about three or four weeks ago, the substantive uh, deletion or uh, attempt to not be able to do If there is a victim impact state that is so highly prejudicial uh, and so emotive that, that it has the potential to really um, change the judge with regards to what we consider to be an appropriate sentence. How would you deal with that? Well, there's no doubt about it. You have to deal with it. But it's, it's a question of... Um, <clears throat> uh, the fact of the matter is, so many of them are highly emotional. So many of them are, 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 uh, are coming from somebody who's obviously emotion-charged and affected to so much so that they can't really be uh, impartial. Um, you, you, you have to you have to take each case on a case by case basis. Um, think of who the judge is. Think of who the prosecutor is. Uh, how are they both going to react if you take the judge through the um, victim impact statement? Uh, uh, <clears throat> if it's so highly charged and highly emotional and unreasonable, all you need to do is is say to the judge, look. You can see, Your Honour, I'll, I'll let you use your own judgement as to whether it's sensible or not, whether you should act on what's being said in this particular area here or that particular area there. And you'll find when you're making that submission that the judge will be uh, often nodding the head in agreement. Um, uh, the judges are diplomatic as well because they don't want to say, in the knowledge that the victims are in, in court, uh, yes, Mr Cash, I, I accept that what you're saying there is that the victim has said something ridiculous there. Uh, I, I take that on board, Mr Cash. Rather than being confronting to, to, to the victim, the judge will, will more or less nod, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you've got to be careful, though, not to uh, contradict uh, factual assertions uh, being made by the victim uh, lest the judge will say, well, if you want to take issue with that, we'll get the victim in here. And just that, that you'll just go backwards. Um, unfortunately, it's a, a case, I think, of uh, giving it a general submission uh, and, and then backing away. So if you said to the judge, <coughs> look, 
demonstrating remorse and accepting the, the seriousness of offending me and me. I could have understanding that and if it was the victim, the rest of it um, is understandable that the discretion is to have a trade to blood. In other words, so it's not running away from or bashing the victim, but saying, look, we, we thoroughly accept that it could be the responsibility that we all accept, etc. But the other bits, the other plays don't do it. That's sort of your you discretion. Know, oh, yes, but. but Remember when I was talking about how it is you should structure your plea? Um, one of uh, I like to structure the plea by, uh, by dividing it into an opening, dealing with the personal circumstances of the accused, because they want to know a bit about the accused's personal circumstances, how old he or she is to begin with, background, general points on the plea, and uh, circumstances of the offending and the penalty. But in relation to the circumstances of the offending, you might want to make submissions about the facts of the offending and you might want to say, well, look, we accept the accused has done this, but um, look, can we just say in relation to what he's done, compare it to other cases, it's not as bad, it's not as bad for this, you might want to uh, address the facts of the case and say, look, uh, uh, it was uh, reckless behaviour, it wasn't intentional behaviour, Your Honour. Um, the injuries that were occasioned were serious, but they weren't as serious as perhaps they could have been. So, so whilst you're accepting that you've done the wrong thing, that doesn't mean that you, you should not point out to the judge how the offending itself uh, has factors about it which uh, make it not as bad as otherwise, or there are mitigating factors associated with the facts of the case, like, for example, he was provoked, like, for example, um, you know, those sorts of things. Anybody else? Can I just make a comment yeah. on that victim impact statement coming from the um, OPP side? Yeah. We're actually often very aware of um, the portions that aren't, yeah. that aren't a prejudicial or inadmissible. So, you're not coming to it um, blind without saying whole as bowl as the victim impact statements to be um, yes. accepted fully. <coughs> and quite often the prosecutor will say on tendering that of course your honour will exercise judgment in not taking into account the inadmissible portions. But unfortunately we can't really guide people in what they write in their statements and they're given a step, this is their one chance in a process that rightly or wrongly they feel has shut them out of it. So yes. I think you actually ultimately do your client a disservice to take them on too heavily when, as you say, they are quite easily dealt with in a very common sense approach. And if you're on the other side, um, <clears throat> as counsel for the accused, you're able to say, look, uh, my friends won't disagree with this submission. Exactly you, right. you, the, the prosecution are put in a position where they're provided with this document. Uh, that's an end document. They didn't construct what's in it, they're simply provided with it, often it's the informant, the police officer, who with respect um, won't have an appreciation of um, uh, what's going to be taken issue with or not. And so it is that uh, you're able to say as counsel for the accused, well look, uh, Your Honour, um, please ignore what <coughs> I would invite you to accept is really uh, emotive, uh, uh, unacceptable uh, content and uh, from a sentencing perspective and uh, and you can say something like uh, and I expect that my learned friends would uh, uh, even endorse that submission your honour so the point's well made uh, just one other thing too just in relation to sentencing range um, that is our office is really well assisted in obtaining a range linking back to your earlier point if you can give us your plea material early mm -hmm. There's a school, just on that point, there's a school of thought that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, one way of approaching this is to obtain a sentencing range from the prosecution before you've given them anything. They give you the sentencing range and then they get up at the hearing and they say, well, the sentencing range that we submit, Your Honour, is A, B, C and D. <coughs> then you're able to say, not having given the prosecution anything prior to their having given you the sentencing range 
indicated the sentencing range to you prior to the hearing, you're able to say, look, Your Honour, but they said that ages ago. Now we've got all this mitigating material. Surely it's less than that. Um, that's the other way of looking at it. But um, in, in certainly my experience, and I think I was talking about Jeff Tobin, uh, when he briefs me, he always is at pains to want to get the material to the prosecution in advance so that in the knowledge that most of the prosecutors, or all of the prosecutors, are very reasonable... We really are a reasonable um, <laughs> They're prepared to, generally speaking, um, <clears throat> uh, accept that you're coming from a reasonable perspective. Uh, and hopefully you can reach some degree of consensus uh, as you approach the plea. All right. Um, talk about preparation. Yeah. Do you think it's an advantage to your client if you prepared sufficient that you uh, attempt to get them to the judge or possibly the magistrate the night before so they have an opportunity to agree and absorb what you're proposing? Or is that... Mm. I, I actually prefer not to. <coughs> Excuse me. Only for this reason. Uh, it, it puts the other side on notice, and then you'll find. Well, I didn't say serve it on the other side. Oh no, you you, you you would not serve anything on the judge without providing it to the other side as well. That wouldn't be proper. Um, <clears throat> fairness dictates that if you're going to provide something uh, to one of the parties, i.e., the judge, um, you've got to give it to everyone else. But in terms of providing the submissions that you make in advance, I, I tend to prefer not to, only because it then, particularly with the Crown on, on the op opposite side, and in the knowledge that it has a wealth of uh, sources of material that it can go to, uh, and support of staff and so forth, you'll find that you, if you provide it to them two or three days in advance, then you're confronted with six or seven unreported decisions. Uh, come the day of the hearing, which is which is very awkward when you first see them when you're first standing on your feet, particularly when they contradict the submission that you've just made. All right? Okay, thank you. Well, I think it's uh, nearly 20 to 9. I'm sure everybody's ready to uh, go off and do other things. So thank you very much for attending. And we look forward to seeing you here again. Thank you.